Awesome. Welcome to uh, North Sect Psychedelic Edition. Um, so you're not seeing it, but I don't have the, uh, the Q&A anymore. Um, but it's all right, I have it here. So welcome to the uh, Cryptography Block Q&A panel discussion. Um, you know, we're doing this live, so it'll, you know, take its own form. Um, there's been a lot of questions uh, on Slido, so I'm, I'm quite happy about that. Um, it's very interesting topics uh, to be discussed. Um, I think the first one really, uh, the first group of questions uh, about DRAND, uh, quite a lot of interest on the, uh, you know, the, the resilience of the network, the, the threshold, you know, how many new nodes uh, uh, introduction would become a problem. Um, you know, what kind of protection mechanisms exist uh, to avoid these kind of uh, takeovers by uh, nefarious actors, maybe, you know, someone thinking about uh, what we have heard potentially uh, could happen with Tor or other types of distributed systems. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk a bit about this, Yolan. Yeah, so... Can you hear? Ula. Yeah, so th that, that's a thing I, I haven't really um, discussed in my talk, but the the trust assumption and um, the way the, um, the randomness is generated make it so that it's enough for just a single node to generate proper uh, randomness during the setup process for the whole uh, thing to be properly random. So that's a very strong assumption. We, uh, it's a very strong result because you don't need to trust any node but one and then you're sure you get proper randomness at the end. So that's super cool. Uh, the current threshold is at like 12, so it means half of the network could go down, and uh, that, that's what I've, I've discussed. But the, the thing is, as long as among the 12 signers, you have one honest party and the, very, and the signatures check out at the end, you're good to go. So the, the main issue is as soon as you have a threshold of malicious node, then they can collude, you know? They can work together and produce signatures ahead of time, they can um, go faster, they can break the trust assumption you have in the network, and that's the main issue you have if you have a threshold number of nodes that are malicious. So the, the bigger the threshold, the safer you are against collusions, but the bigger the threshold, the the less safe you are from a liveness point of view, because if a few nodes go down, I don't know, like if AWS goes down and we have like uh, maybe six nodes on AWS, then we need to make sure the rest of the network will keep working properly. Um, Thanks. Yeah. All right. It's a, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very good answer. Um, there. You know, of, of course, lots of concern on resilience, uh, but, you know, probably also uh, on capacity. You know, what's, what's the speed like? How many, um, you know, random nonces can you generate per second, per minute, per hour? What are we looking like? Is the addition of nodes going to influence that? Um, you know, are these sorts of things? I don't know if you can cover a bit on that. Yeah, so... The, the current way it works is each node will generate a signature every x seconds. So the, the current networks is generating one random 256-bit value every 30 seconds. So that's really the, um, the current bandwidth. Uh, the new network we launched on testnet is uh, generating one value every three seconds. So it's way faster. The lowest we tried to go is one second. Uh, you could go lower in theory, but then you start to have issues with latency and like cur the current latency on signature aggregation is around 800 milliseconds. So if you want to go below one second, you would need very good connections between the nodes. And it becomes then very also difficult to consume. Um, so, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, quite a few, um, quite a few questions uh, for you, Christian. Um, you know about you know claim QR and SHC. Um, I think you know uh, at the end of the talk, I'm talking about digital identity. Um, 
you know, some people, I guess, were, were kind of asking because it's, it's in the air, so to speak, right, especially here in Quebec when, you're, when we're talking about uh, the, the, the efforts that the government is, is looking at for, for digital identity. Um, you know, could ClaimQR help, for instance, in replacing social security numbers or other elements of, uh, of identity um, that, that we use um, on a not daily basis, but quite a regular basis, and we've seen issues with, you know, leaks and whatnot? <clears throat> Well, um, I think these types of, uh, of credentials can help in day-to-day yeah, -day life. Maybe not so much social security numbers, because that's typically a very infrequent way. And the way they are leaked, it's not when they are presented, but mostly when they are you know, stored in the database and then the database gets exposed. But um, it's, it's easy to imagine scenarios for things we use already, right? So the, the driver's license is the one that, that most people Use to you know get into a bar or, or whatever, and um, but once you have these type of things in place, then you can imagine a lot more scenarios, especially uh, online. Let's say yeah, your school could issue you a, a alumni uh, credential you, you could use to get some some rebates online at some restaurants or whatnot, or same thing, uh, employers or employment verification. Uh, you, uh, I hate to use this word, <laughs> the, the, the metaverse identity. You know, you could you could give your your online uh, <clears throat> avatars and presence some some actually identity attributes, and of course they wouldn't be in the form of a QR there. But if if they're just packaged in a, a um, <clears throat> in a type of credential uh, for which the user controls the key, uh, therefore the ownership, and they they can decide and select how this information can be disclosed and by whom. So, I mean, user-centric in the sense of user empowerment. So, okay, that's what the verifier want to see. And um, then uh, what's, uh, I can make the decision if I want to present that information and what's the minimal set I can present. That's why I like to use the word minimal disclosure. So, the minimum that's needed for a particular transaction. So, sometimes that's nothing. It's anonymous. Sometimes it's your full identity for, you know, crossing a border. Um, so the, the QR form is interesting because it, it bridges the gap between these online credentials for which you need you know, a key store and maybe a smartphone, but there's a wide range of, 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 of scenarios before that. That's just QR. You can carry it on paper, literally. And it, it, uh, so there's, there's a few opportunities, I think, that hopefully the ecosystem can help build. Thanks a lot. And um, you know, are there any any attempts to kind of unify um, these uh, various health cards that exist around the world? You mentioned that there were, uh, you know, multiple competing standards, I guess. Um, you know, and when we're talking about um, digital identity, it might be just broader than, than vaccine scenarios. Um, are you aware of any such attempts to, to unify some of these standards? Yeah, so there's no uh, effort to unify them the same way there's no effort to unify the passports. You know, it's like each country do, do their own thing. And that's mainly the result of, you know, all the planet trying to solve the same problem at the same time in a very rapid uh, time frame. So these identity um, specifications, they take typically years to, to develop. So it was, it's a miracle that it happened in search. So I think the framework is like a one year old. and. Uh, the reason it succeeded it was because it was um, rooted in, in the medical world um, where they want to use that for a long time for when, you know, for your, your kid's school vaccination history that you have to carry over from state to state and, and, and be able to present that to schools for travel immunizations in the future. So they say, okay, let's use this situation to build something that's going to be lasting and reusable. So that's why here it was successful. And it, other jurisdictions in the world had to, to solve the same problem for their own uh, case. So, in, in Europe, th yeah, they decided to their green certificate is not just the medical fact; it's also a decision. You know, so it could be a lab test, it could be an exemption, and it's it's you get a green check mark th uh, out of that. So it's, it was a different scope, different decision. Here is, I said, we don't want to make these decisions. Here's the facts, and whoever checks it makes the decision based on the current policy. Yeah. Thanks. Um, all right, I want to I want to go back maybe to, um, to to talking about you know we're you know talking about uh, entities and how these get set up. Um, you know, you you know you've had to set up 
um, uh, well, work to set up the, the, the League of Entropy. I, I, like, I like this, um, <laughs> this, uh, this, this name. Um, but there were a few questions about you know, how um, this was set up as, a, as an organization, how one gets to join it, uh, you know, is there any paperwork involved, um, is there any uh, some you know, formalities, uh, or is it just you know, open to anyone? Um, I guess you know, people want to maybe see uh, what it entails and if they can help. Yeah, so the, it's basically a question of how do you do your governance and your network, right? So uh, currently the League of Entropy um, has a notion of each member is voting on new members uh, to join. Maybe we'll come up with a better way to do the governance at, at some point where we can delegate voting power whatsoever. But currently, that's how it is because we are only, uh, as I said, 16 members, so it's still okay. Um, the, um, to join, it's, uh, you just need to show interest, show that you've got the, the, the proper setup and the infrastructure, and then you can onboard on the test net uh, if you get accepted. And, uh, once you've shown you were able to run a node on testnet and it worked, you can upgrade to mainnet. So that's how it works uh, on our side, yeah. So if you, I guess if you got a bunch of lava lamps, you're good to go. Yeah. That's how it works. Or even just a fish and uh, some bubble generator in your aquarium, you know, that's also chaotic, so. Awesome. Um, so there, there was a, um, you know, there, there was a, a mention, uh, you know, in your talk about um, time-locked encryption, um, and I think there are a few folks that I'm, I'm seeing here asking, you know, how does this work? I think it's a, it's a very new research, and you know, might be a bit, uh, a bit complex. But can you maybe drill down a bit on, on how this is uh, thought about, and um, you know, if there's going to be future work on that, and what it's going to entail? Yeah, so the, the time lock encryption is something I'm super excited about because it's, it's super cool, in my opinion, to be able to encrypt something toward the future. Um, the thing is, we're still working on the paper and the blog post, so it's going to be released in July or maybe August, uh, hopefully. Uh, we, we will also release an open source tool that allows you to use it, so no worries, it's coming. Um, the, technically, it's a bit difficult to just explain, you know, like, out of the blue without a, um, a whiteboard. But um, what you do is you take the value you want to encrypt, you pick a random value, which is secret. You can XOR the both together, and you get an encrypted message, which is a one-time pad, basically. You, you encrypted something with one-time pad. And now that random value will get committed towards the round in the future. And using the pairings, uh, we can decrypt, well, decommit that commitment as soon as the signature is published for that round. And that might give you a bit of an intuition of how it works, I guess. So I guess it's upcoming work. So maybe uh, NordSec 2023. Yeah, we hope to be done before that, I guess. All right, awesome. Um, so let's step back a bit and maybe go into the, um, um, you know, the more uh, theoretical, well, theoretical applied crypto. You know, um, there's there's been a, a you know some questions about. I know, Christian, you've got maybe a bit of background there on quantum cryptography. Uh, you know, what's uh, in your opinion, and you know, you of course uh, you as well being a cryptographer. What do you think? Um, you know, how far are we from mainstream adoption? What's you know, what, what are the hurdles, basically, for it not to be post-quantum crypto, for it not to be um, adopted today? What kind of standardization do we, do we need? Um, you know, and, and um, you know, maybe what's, uh, what's the, in your opinion, what's the, the road uh, to getting there? Yeah, first, uh, a little terminology explanation. So uh, <laughs> quantum cryptography, it's typically, uh, typically means quantum key distribution. Uh, which is uh, the ability to using quantum mechanisms to establish a, a shared key that you can use then with conventional encryption. So I think that that's very little chance of being uh, widely deployed. It's been deployed kind of in, in pilot and very specialized environments. 
but the, the classical uh, cryptography that we have today is sufficient, I think, for real-world scenarios. Um, the other word, that's post-quantum cryptography. So that's, that's what it means. It's normal cryptography that you run with ordinary classical computers, but for which we don't know how to break with a future quantum computer. So a quantum computer is a, a machine that, if, if we end up building, uh, could break the crypto that we use today. And the problem, why is that a problem now, if it's going to be built in 20 years, is that you can record the traffic today and decrypt it in 20 years, which in some cases, if you're a Coca-Cola and you're trying to protect your recipe forever, then that might be a problem. Um, so um, this, uh, as I mentioned in the talk at the beginning, just NIST, is, uh, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, they are uh, yeah, working on replacements of, of quantum algorithms, so they're waiting, uh, or waiting any day now after a, a three-plus-year process to, to see which is going to be the next uh, round of algorithms that are going to replace RSA and, and the CDSA. And so uh, these are the ones that are they're very close to, to be picked, and then it's going to take a year or two to write up and standardize. So uh, we're in a comfortable, let's you know, change the uh, the underpinning and the machinery of, of the, the, the crypto pipelines before uh, it's too late. So I think that's in good shape. Yeah, and if you look also at what's being done in the on the mailing list and you know online, people are still not super are not agreeing on oh we should do it. Like, should we combine current classical um, algorithms with the new quantum resistant algorithms? Should we switch over to the new algorithms even though the current ones have been battle tested and we know they work properly or at least we hope they do? Um, these are questions that still need to be answered like because if you want to do hybrid encryption or you combine both quantum resistant algorithms with the classical algorithms, it's not the same as if you say, okay, we ditch the classical stuff and we jump on the new cool quantum resistant uh, train, you know? And um, people are getting worried as well because like the recently, I think it was in, in the US, uh, they said, okay, now all the secret, top secret stuff needs to move on to uh, quantum resistant tech like within five years or something like that. And people were like, what, what's happening? They didn't even standardize the post-quantum algorithms yet. Why do they do that now? So, yeah. Yeah, I can just like add a note to that. So uh, yeah, that's a, that's a fair point that uh, there might be this transitional period where we're gonna use hybrid um, encryption, hybrid in the sense of yeah, combining more than one uh, scheme. And that's something that uh, we've implemented uh, it's not something that's pushed necessarily by, by NIST, as their, their goal is to say it's a new standard, but it's something that the industry are, is wondering about if that would be a good idea. There's this project which I've talked about in a, a, a two North sex ago. Uh, it's the Open Quantum Safe project. If you look that up, it's led by the University of Waterloo, and we've prototyped all the new algorithms, including in, com in combinations and hybrid way with uh, the current one with, with RSA or ECDSA and or uh, electric, I'm sorry, EC defilement. Um, so uh, you, you, you can run that in OpenSSL and OpenSSH, see how it looks. And at the end of the day, there's going to be some people, it's going to be their choice, their, their policy to uh, what's the performance versus uh, expected security. And there's going to be a large body of people who won't care that just follow the government standards, <laughs> whichever they'll pick. So um, it's, yeah, hopefully NIST will, will uh, you know, in the academic community will, will have picked good uh, replacement. So at, at some point, that, that's going to be the new, the new one. All right, thanks a lot. I think that, you know, that leads kind of well into uh, the next question, um, maybe a bit even, even broader. You know, there's been a lot of, um, We've seen the pickup of certain popular software like, um, you know, like you know, Wireshark to give an example versus uh, OpenVPN. Very different approaches, um, and you know, you've just mentioned that the government, um, you know, the NIST will standardize some form of algorithm. Maybe people can use some other algorithm. 
Um, you know, in cryptography, there might have been some times where we had a discussion about uh, enforcing sane defaults versus letting the users choose themselves um, what to what to what to use in terms of algorithms. Um, you know, what what's your what's your take on this? Um, you know, what would be a preferred approach? Should, should we let the users choose which algorithm when it gets standardized uh, or some configuration? But then it could lead into the you know TLS uh, SSL TLS issues where you know basically. Uh, Death by a potential thousand paper cuts. Um, so, what's the what's the you know what's the the, the theme there? The leading discussions around uh, quantum resilient uh, cryptography. Yeah, I mean, it's I'll give a, a kind of like large vendor answer. It's like Microsoft, which is, we have such a varied uh, set of, of customers from all over the spectrum. So it's it's really hard to pick for them. So as a crypto developer, it's yeah, it's, it's kind of harmful to give too much choice, and, and uh, it's easier to give just you know very minimal set of configurations so you can shoot yourself in the foot. On the other hand, it depends. You know, so the, like, the cryptography in China is very different uh, than in the U.S., and we we you know we provide software all around the globe. So uh, the platform itself needs to be uh, adaptable for that. Um, uh, but I think it's recognized, right? The mis the crypt it's not mistakes because you know it's doing the best we can, but the, the crypto community learned a lot of lessons in the last 10 years. We see all the TLS attacks like Heartbleed and all these things year after year. And then the TLS 1.3 is, I think, is a good example of a, a standard that had a good uh, analysis and review by the academic community. And a lot of the research was applied there, and there's way fewer choices. So when it came out of the box, it was okay. Okay, great. Like uh, good configuration, and then the industry or some part of the industry fought back to trying to put back some features, some, like the RSA encryption, because they needed in middle boxes for for uh, traffic intercept for you know some time valid reasons so that you know kids don't go and browse the nasty parts of the internet. So it's just when they're in school, right? Like so, uh, there's going to be an equilibrium, but I, I, I kind of tend to like the direction where where the practical security is going. So it's. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a complicated answer and situation for sure. All right, Yolande, you want to chime in? I know we discussed a bit about, you know, <laughs> this topic earlier on. Yeah, well, I, I would say crypto agility is a good thing for protocol designers and for software developers, but it's a terrible thing for users, in my opinion, because it, it allows, you know, like non-crypto developers to shoot themselves in the foot way too easily. Like if you look at the Jose spec, uh, or they could choose the non-encryption algorithms, which wouldn't encrypt anything and that kind of issues. I mean, sure, they wanted to do good and to provide a lot of options, but at the end, it, were, it was too many. So I like also the way TLS 1.3 reduced the number of options to just a safe set and how they did it. And I think it's super important for us as protocol designers to be able to quickly switch to new algorithms if we see something got broken and that's not working anymore. And it's, in my opinion, also a good reason to go the hybrid way rather than directly jump the, to, to uh, quantum resistant algorithms. But yeah, we'll see. All right, so I guess the debate lives on. Uh, but there's a tendency towards simplifying things and, and you know, leaving less uh, options to shoot yourself in the foot. Um, all right, so um, it was a, it was a, it was a you know, great session. Lots of good questions. I went through most of them. Um, thanks a lot, Yolan, and uh, thanks a lot for, 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 all, the, for all the help uh, and uh, answering these, uh, these questions, Christian, as well. Um, if you have any more questions, uh, you can probably uh, find both gentlemen uh, maybe grabbing a beer at the bar or later in the, in the chill room. Uh, thank you all for submitting all these great questions, and uh, I guess uh, see you on the next, uh, the next block, and that will be uh, the red team block uh, in... Uh, Almost uh, 30 minutes now. Have a good one, everyone. Go ahead.